And now on BBC One, another exciting observation test with... introduce you to some of the characters you will meet. Hello, I'm Andrew. Hello, I'm Lisa. Welcome to episode 51 of... Round the Archives. Well, things should calm down a bit after yes. the celebrations for episode mm-hmm. 50. Though, thank you to everyone who listened in July, mm-hmm. because for the first time ever, we went through the barrier of 2,000 listens. Hooray! Which is astonishing. Yes. I don't know when we, whether we win a badge or what, but hey. <laughs> Yes. But let's let's carry on as Simon and Ken from the Exton Moss Experiment take a look at an episode of Out of the Unknown. The Exton Moss Experiment. Adventures in Wine and Space with Simon Exton and Ken Moss. Hello boys and girls and a very warm welcome to the Exton Moss Experiment. I'm Ken Moss. I'm Simon Exton. And we are again breaking into Round the Archives. Thank you, Andy and Lisa. Hello. Today we're going to be looking at an episode of Out of the Unknown, which is a BBC science fiction anthology from the late 60s, early 70s. For the first couple of years, it was in black and white. Um, the first three years or so, it did fairly faithful adaptations of science fiction classics, people like Frederick Pohl, Isaac Asimov, and a few more unusual ones written specifically for the series episodes, but not a huge number. The fourth series, different producer change of tack, it became much more psychological and supernatural. The episode we're going to be looking at is from the second series, it's called The Machine Stops. Now, I've been looking forward to this one for a while. Yeah. I'm going to ask you not to give us a premise on this one. Okay. I'll, I'll give you a bit of historical background. Okay. It's based on a E.M. Forster short story written in 1909. We'll, we'll talk about the, the short story itself and the kind of things that it predicts and the flaws that it has and the strengths that it has after we, fin- we finish the episode. This is a big chunk of what got me into science fiction telly. I've talked before about the uh, Past Visions of the Future event that was at the National Film Theatre in the late 80s. This was one of the episodes that they showed and absolutely awakened my curiosity for the the series to the point where I got hold of every one of the um, the original stories that were adapted for the series and, and read them because at the time there, there wasn't any chance of seeing anything else. It was unlikely that it would ever be repeated particularly the, the black and white ones. So this is a very special episode for me. It, it's a, a very, very good episode as well. And rather than saying any more about it, shall we just crack on? We should, but we've got two bits of housekeeping first. We do. First of all, we need to get out the tonic screwdriver and open the gym. Three bits of housekeeping, actually, because the Round the Archives team have not met the third member of our team. They haven't, actually. Would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? You heard Oh, he's a little, he's in a grump today and he's a bit shy. This is Spath, the Silurian, and he will be interjecting when he sees fit, but he's, he's terribly grumpy. Sometimes he likes stuff, sometimes he doesn't. We'll see. So, introduction's done. Let's get out the tonic screwdriver. Then we will penetrate from here. Okay, we've whipped off the top of the gin. Which one have we got for today? We've got aviation gin, and refreshingly, it has no info bollocks whatsoever on the uh, the bottle. It's just this is gin. It's American. Fill your boots. I don't like it. Really? No. Oh. It tastes like penicillin with coconut in it. No, definitely not. You see, I quite like that. I I, I hadn't actually got the coconut in it before, but I can see what you mean by that. I think it, it's a little bit peppery. I don't think it's any, anything more than a three. I really don't like that. It's a one from me, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Do you want something different? I'll, I'll let you force that down, and I'll, I'll go and get a, a refill. Let us descend into the bowels of Podcasting House and open the door of the Black Archive. <laughs> 
Surrounding us on the shelves are all the bits of lost television and film that have ever existed. And radio. And radio. Because we have pulled radio out of the Black Archive before. Well, that actually leads me on to my, my choice for today, which is the 1955 version of The Lord of the Rings on radio. It was a 12-part series. The BBC broadcast it on the light programme. It was... So they sort of weren't with Tolkien on it, but he wasn't very happy. He was... Um, there were several things that had been adapted of his for radio. I think there was a reading of The Hobbit, which he didn't like, and I believe he didn't like it so much that he read it himself in the end. But he didn't like this version. Uh, the Fellowship of the Ring took up the first six episodes. Two Towers and Return of the King took up the second six. And general reviews were... It was just unadaptable for radio. It was a terrible book to choose and it needed more space to breathe. I would agree that 12 episodes is a little bit short to tell three massive volumes worth of story. I would agree that it's a terrible book. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's dull. Dull, dull, no, dull, it's, dull, dull. Uh, it's one of my all-time favourites. It's a family favourite. And there's uh, the 1981 version, uh, Radio 4 version of Lord of the Rings. is beautiful. It's still possibly my favourite adaptation. For me, probably better than the films. Because it, it's not all about battle sequences. It's there's, there's more of the story comes out and it's condensed. And the... The dull bits are all the wiki's trimmed. So I think if you if you're reading them as books, they are heavy going. There's so, no getting around it. And the, the thing about Lord of the Rings, yeah, it was absolutely groundbreaking at its time. But its time was the 1940s. Those types of stories have been done with a much much cleaner and more modern writing style. Mm. Um, Guy Gavriel Kay, for example, brilliant Tolkien-esque fantasy, much more accessible, much more readable. And I mean, his stuff's 30 years old now if not 40, because I was reading those mid-80s. But they're still very re readable. I've only read the first book, and I only got through it because I was stuck in a ferry, on a ferry in the middle of the Irish Sea <laughs> with no money for the bar. Right. Um, and it was the only thing that I had to read. That's the only reason I got through it. I found it incredibly dull. Well, of course, um, of course it's worth But I've been reading things like... David Eddings, the Belgarians, mm. um, the Dragonlance books before before then. So I read the, the modernised version before I read the original. Now, for fantasy fiction written at that time, Gormenghast still really holds up. What's going on in that? Uh, oh, the, he tried to read the third book because he, he was doing no, the brain, brain no. tumour at the time and it makes no sense. But no, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I tried to watch, there was a TV adaptation, probably about 20 years ago now. What the hell's going on in that? It was like, because June Brown was in it, and I just thought, I really, really want to like this, but it's like being in the inside of Dot Cotton's LSD nightmare. It's, what the hell is going on? Yeah, because there, uh, there were a lot of good people in it, weren't there? Richard Griffiths mm. and um, Zoe Wanamaker and... I really enjoyed it, but it's, I think it's probably a bit like The City in the City. I'd read the book beforehand, mm. which meant that I knew the story, so I could just enjoy it as a telling of that story that I already knew. Coming to it cold, I imagine it may have been a bit of a head. So, putting that to one side, what are you rescuing from the archive today? Right, I'm going to rescue another BBC TV science fiction adaptation from around about the same time as Out of the Unknown. And it was an adaptation in the Strand Story Parade of Isaac Asimov's novel The Caves of Steel. There are a few clips that survive um, that look very good. Uh, it stars Peter Cushing, so that's always good. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would really like to see it because it, again, it's one of his robot sequence. And Out of the Unknown adapted a number of his robot novels, and none of those adaptations survive. They do the profit, they do satisfaction guaranteed, and none of those have survived. Some of his other things that have been adapted for uh, Out of the Unknown do survive. So we've got things like uh, The Dead Past, which is wonderful, which we did, uh, Sucker Bait. But, the, but none of those, those are part of his sort of classic robot sequence. And actually there are some parallels between Caves of Steel and this in terms of plot, which we can talk about afterwards because I'm not going to spoil the plot for you. Excellent. All right, so we'll crack on and we'll see you on the flip side. Well, 
that was the machine stop. So it's something that I've been. Um, it's been on the list for a while. Aiming for us to do yeah. for, for a long time. I absolutely love that, which is why it's been on the list for a long time. Just to give a little pricey of the mm-hmm. plot before we dissect before it. We, yeah. It's set in the far future where humanity has retreated to subterranean cities and each person living in their own room. Everything that they want or need is provided for them by the machinery around them. Uh, and there's a, a religion that's grown up about this, that um, every citizen has has a book which is basically a user manual for the machine, but it, it's taken on a, an almost religious significance. And actually, as the story goes further, you see that it's taken on an absolutely religious significance. The story is basically a two-hander between an enlightened modern woman, Vashti, and her son, Kuno. Vashti is a devout adherent of the, uh, the cult of the machine and believes that she's spiritually enlightened and modern and everything the machine does is good and for the best. Kuno is much more keen on doing things for himself. He's fascinated by what goes on on the surface of the, the earth. He builds up his physical strength so he can go to the surface of the earth. He found, finds a, a break in the, the wall of the tunnel that, that's near him. Going through that, finds an old ladder that takes him up to the surface of the earth. And he finds that he, he can't cope with the, uh, the physical stresses that are up there. He's blown over by wind. He, he has trouble breathing the air. And the machine sends out tendrils to, um, to encapsulate him and, and bring him back. He's seen by a young girl who is living on the, um, the Earth's surface, the implication being that she's part of a, a group of people who live outside of the machine. She goes to try and help him and is killed. He's pulled back down to um, banned by the machine from going onto the, the Earth's surface again. And the, the final sequence of the, the play is where the machine starts to break down. The title of the machine stops comes from a quote from Kuno, who says to his mother, I've had this new idea, the machine stops. And she can't cope with this idea. She um, dismisses it as ridiculous. She laughs hysterically. But bit by bit, the parts of the machine that she relies on stop working. And in the end, everything stops working. The the inhabitants of the cities are sort of seen crawling almost Mm worm-like through the tunnels. Kuno, while he's, because he's more physically strong than the others, is able to walk through the tunnels. But he's knocked down by a kind of tram thing. The final sequence is where Vashti, having gone out into the uh, the tunnels to try and find Kuno, finds him, but he's dying after the uh, the impact with the tram. Between them, they come to realise that the machine is ultimately a bad thing, and that at some point a civiliz- another civilization will come along that will start the machine up again. Mm. And then the the cities are sort of engulfed in a white flare, and you you assume that whatever their their power source is has. Uh, has blown up. Yeah, a bit ambiguous that ending. I did like it. I liked it very much, but the ending is very much left to the viewer to make up your mind what happened. Well, they both die. That, that's fairly. Well, he dies. It's, um, she looks up and there's some sort of slow flare and a, a rumble, but. But she's not even able to stand up. No, but that's um, because they're all heavily reliant on this. Yeah, and the, 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 thing, free, don't they? the thing that gives them their food has stopped. It might not be that they're. Uh, the thing blows up, but they're, they're all dead. Yeah, we've well, I've seen two of these out of the unknowns now, and uh, in both of them, everyone dies. Yeah. So, is there a running theme with this? No, not really. Some of them are some of them are, some of them are quite jolly. Well, a couple of them are. Yeah. Um, you see, the next one is Lambda One, which is another one of my favourites. There are people who die in it, but it has a kind of happy ending. I must say that the the series itself, if those two are representative of what the series is like. This is 1966, yes. did you say? The sets are excellent. The sets and the special effects for the time are very impressive. Well, there's, there's actually very little in the way of special effects other than the sets themselves. Well, that's what I mean. Um, and the, the, the backgrounds of, of the sets move. Yeah, there's a bit of mirror on. Yeah, bits of the floor, will, floor move up. They sit in... It's like a dentist chair, but with a, um, a hexagonal TV screen mm. that they communicate through each other. The language is interesting as well, because Kuno's way of speaking is very old-fashioned. Mm. Uh, no, okay, this was written in 1909, but his speech is almost... It's almost a Shakespearean quality mm. about it, isn't there? Particularly when he's describing the outside. And as as the play goes on, that becomes more pronounced. Whereas her speech is very clipped and mechanical. 
until it gets to the end and, and, and she starts to break down and panic. Mm. That must have been an either love it or hate it series, or certainly an episode. It's not your typical, well, I'd say it's not your typical 1960s episode, but some of the stuff we watched is completely off its face. You have to have a reasonable amount of, of imagination and love for this type of story to watch that, which I do. Yeah. I, I, and it, is, it's interesting how a hundred years before the time, because this is a... A hundred and ten-year-old story. A hundred and ten-year-old story. This is a 53-year-old adaptation, mm. and it's predicted social media. There are a few little niggles with the plot. So there, there's one point where Kuno has applied to the uh, to the machine for permission to become a father, and they turn him down because he has a degree of physical strength. However, in the the scenes where you see Vashti going to to visit Kuno on the the airship, and that that's a wonderful sequence because mm. she, uh, the the attendant opens up the um, a sort of viewing window, and they're flying over the Himalayas, and she said Vashti says this gives me no ideas. And the, the attendant is basically saying, well, okay, I'm a bit old fashioned. I, I used to, I, I call it Asia by its old name. And people, people have called this the roof of the world for, uh, since the start of civilization. And the Vashti turns around and said, what's that white stuff on top of it? Mm. And the attendant is just, oh, oh, I can't remember the name for it. The fact that there is an attendant who walks up and down and answers questions and is, is basically an employee kind of jars a little bit with the rest of the, yeah. the whole thing where everybody in humanity is in almost sort of wally type chairs yeah. and there, there's a, a sequence where when kuno is getting himself ready to go out he takes the uh, the pillow off the bed and is using that to to build up his muscles and when he drops it on the floor rather than him bending down to pick it up the floor lifts it mm. up to him and he, he no i will do this myself having Somebody who's in that position of servitude doesn't really fit. No, it doesn't. I've not thought about that until you said it, but yeah, you're right there. Uh, we must revisit House of the Unknown. The two that we've seen so far have been very, very good pieces of television. Yeah. There are a couple that aren't great, but there's more than enough that are for, mm. for us to easily have an episode for. I was going to compare that to Caves of Steel, and I didn't want to talk about this oh, yes, we um, said, yes. before I told you the plot. Uh, Caves of Steel is a, about a murder investigation on the colonies in Mars. And there are very few people there and they all live in isolation. A big plot point is the fact that they're actually extremely uncomfortable with direct physical contact between humans because they live right. in isolation. And there's an element of that there when, when Kuno is asking Vashti to come and see him. I can't go out of my room. There will be direct contact. There will be direct experience. Mm. Oh, that direct experience, was it? Yes. It's talking about a, a cult of enforced isolation mm. where that is normalised. I think this is a wonderful piece of television. I've watched it loads of times. I still really enjoy watching it. I get, I get a, a lot out of seeing it. I, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Mm, it's I did. one of my favourites. And we must watch more out of the unknown yeah. in future because I, I, I did had worried a little lot. that this was going to be a corridor people moment. No, not at all. That was this is um I think the word you use is dystopian view of the future where everybody is nobody yes. nobody's particularly happy in it and they're all living in this compartmentalized it's a, a bleak view of the future. Yeah, and there, there's one point where Vashti said I asked for euthanasia because my lecture didn't work properly or wasn't or wasn't well received. Yes, this is a bleak view of the future. Level 7 is a bleak view of the future. Mm -hmm. Other episodes aren't quite as bleak. There's a couple that are possibly a little bit bleaker that we could look at. We don't often watch things that are outright bleak. You, well, there's, there's one particular example. Well, Threats. No, you know, that's just I'll, been released on DVD. Uh, sorry, on Blu-ray. On Blu-ray, yes. In case you want the horror in... I am tempted. I'm te you see, I know that you've seen it twice and that's enough. I haven't seen it once and I'm fascinated to revisit it. And you wanted to watch it with your mum. Mum and dad watched it and they were horrified. So you're sharing the trauma. Well I'm done, sharing yeah. the I think that should be shown in schools. I, I agree completely. If you want to completely eradicate the threat of nuclear war, show threads to kids, or well, high school kids, and get them while their imagination's fresh. This is what will happen, boys and girls. So don't blow each other up. Look after the planet. We've put a lot of work into it. Yeah. So with that, we shall sign off on a, a, a more cheery note. Thank you, Andy and Lisa, for, again, letting us uh, break into your podcast. Um, we will be back in our own podcast, The Exton Moss Experiment. Do look us up on SoundCloud and on iTunes. And also Oral Intercourse. Thank you for listening, boys and girls. We'll hand you back. See you soon. 
Bye now. Many thanks to Simon and Ken. Yes, thank you. Do listen to the Exeter Moss Experiment. It's a very good podcast. It's jolly good, isn't it? Jolly good, yes. And now Martin Holmes returns to take an unusual look at... The Six Million Dollar Man. Steve Austin, astronaut. A man barely alive. We can rebuild him. We have the technology. We can make him better than he was. Better. Stronger. Faster. something of an artist myself, one of the things I most appreciate about watching television is the graphics that make up the title sequences to the shows, and so I thought it might be fun from time to time to do a little bit of deep analysis and dissect one or two of the more notable ones and give us all the chance to appreciate the amount of effort and skill that goes into building these mini masterpieces and make them into something memorable, or at the very least something familiar, and perhaps something enticing enough to persuade us to keep watching, because there's a huge leap from oh, this looks interesting, to I want to stay here and watch this, which can over time transform into oh this is cozy and familiar and yet sometimes the same 30 40 or 50 second sequence does this for viewers using exactly the same techniques that serve both on-screen advertising and film trailers for decades the simpsons is now played with those expectations for well over two decades by tampering with the established sequence on an almost weekly basis and in recent years it's almost become mandatory for some programs to pretty much dispense with a title sequence altogether and just rattle on with the story and flush up a few captions and credits shows like elementary for example can still build exquisite sequences but also offer up truncated versions for episodes where there's just far too much going on however in these rough and tumble times it's good that there is still a place for the good old-fashioned title title sequence that, in the case of certain high-concept shows especially, is there to tell you just what the heck the show is all about. Now, when the viewer is being bombarded by hundreds of channels and thousands of advertising spots, pop-up captions, intrusive voiceovers, shrunken credits, and a whole host of other intrusions into the space that the actual programmers get onto the screen, building an attention-grabbing sequence that persuades you to stay tuned is one of television's more subtle and finest arts. One of the best-loved and perhaps most iconic pieces of film from American television in the 1970s was designed by Jack Cole and begins with a blank black screen, backed by the throbbing tympanum that opens a theme composed by Oliver Nelson, which somehow, at least at first, manages to mimic a heartbeat, which induces the same kind of anticipation as the drum beats would at the start of Oliver Stone's JFK nearly 20 years later. And I thought it might be fun to dissemble this minute and a half long piece of television gold from a show that so inspired and shaped a generation of young people like me from 1973 until its cancellation in 1978. In the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, a capital letter T appears in white sans-serif bold capitals, followed by an H and an E to spell out the word the, as an electronic trilling, not unlike a trim phone, is added to the incessant drumbeat, adding an urgent, computery, high-tech excitement to the soundtrack. Mysterious flashing lights punch out of the darkness in the top half of the screen as, in a slightly larger font, the word six starts to appear letter by letter, accompanied by a heavily distorted voice bursting through as if via an intercom. For years I've been unclear about what was being said here due to that distortion. Tosca to NASA One? Tell Oscar to NASA One? 
but such is the modern day miracle of the internet that it's all out there if you look for it and I'm convincingly informed that the line is it looks good at NASA one. At the same moment, overlaid in blood red tint, high contrast footage of a radar screen appears, its scanner line sweeping around and around and around, ceaselessly in a clockwise direction as if driven by the same pounding rhythm, leaving the background images still visible through the shadowed area. The background changes to a sweeping pan across the orange lights of a mysterious building lit up through a deep dark night as the next word spelled on the same line as that six is finally spelt out. M I L L I O N and NASA One responds Roger. Now I don't have to explain that this is a standard call sign, do I? Nobody's asking who the heck Roger is as they sit in their armchairs waiting for the program to continue. No? Good. Funny how certain phrases within our cultures need no explanation. BCS arm switches on. Well, I believe them. And as that panning shot continues, we hear OK Victor. Here, I'm assuming unlike Roger, someone was referring to an actual Victor. As a third line of text appears D O L. L. A. R. And the VHF radio communications continue over this. Lighting rods are armed. Apparently. Though what exactly those might actually be, I don't know. Switches on. Here comes the throttle. Circuit breakers in. All of which is presumably spectacularly meaningless to the viewers at home. Utterly irrelevant to any of the stories that the series will tell. But adds a vital and convincing enough very similitude to whatever it is that makes these grown-up sciencey things seem almost hyper real. And left plenty of small children quoting these lines as if they knew exactly what was going on. Incidentally, although it will reappear, the overlaid image of the radar screen vanishes before the same line of text continues. And the final three letters of that last word, M-A-N, appear to complete the title of the show. The Six Million Dollar Man, in case you were wondering. A show that filled our evenings during the mid-70s, which was about the spy-fi adventures of a cybernetic human with incredible strength and speed built into his robotic solid-state circuitry. A show that gripped us so much as schoolchildren that there had to be regular warnings for us not to try jumping off roofs whenever we went outside to play in super dramatic slow motion, usually accompanied by the iconic <laughs> sound that, that tended to accompany this counterintuitive yet surprisingly effective display of high speed. After that line about the circuit breakers, the screen momentarily fills in totally black again as the experimental sleek silver delta-winged jet aircraft that our hero is test flying is released from the brackets attaching it to its support aircraft and this silver marvel, a technological glimpse of the exciting world of space exploration in those giddy days of the late 1960s and the early part of the 1970s falls vertically away from us and we catch a glimpse of it in its full sunlight catching glory and at the top of the picture we momentarily see the ground so vertigo inducingly very far far below as we hear we have separation accompanied by the doppler roar of engines raising in pitch and almost drowning out that drumbeat for a second this is incidentally all genuine film footage taken from the ill-fated flight of the m2 f2 lifting body which hit the ground doing about 250 miles an hour on may the 10th 1967 with a certain bruce patterson at the controls he incidentally survived the crash and as far as we know never had to be rebuilt despite eventually losing an eye due to the crash, but the footage certainly adds a dramatic real-world veracity to the stories being told. With more than half the screen being filled with the downward pointing sight of that remarkable aircraft, the pulsing soundtrack clearly informs us that we do indeed have separation, inboards and outboards, and there is a hard cut to the face of our star in extreme close-up, framed by a frame-filling space helmet of silver and white and the deep, rich blackness of the inside of that helmet. More lights and readouts and numbers are reflected in the glass of this helmet's visor, but his face is nevertheless clearly visible, as is his name, carved out in capital letters of the same white starkness of that bold font that made up the title of the show, Starring Lee Majors. The word starring is the only use of upper and lower case so far and remains in the slightly smaller font size and screen position that the capital V had in the main title. Lee Majors, one of the iconic TV stars of the 1970s, once a co-star in the Western cowboy adventure and or soap opera series The Big Valley and later also famously successful all over again playing the lead in the Hollywood stuntman themed series The Fall Guy. Genuinely he was as Big a name in 1970s TV as Burt Reynolds was in 1970s movies. A superstar. Articles in magazines were written. Gossip was gossiped. Celebrity weddings were wedded. He was married, for a while, to another 1970s icon, Farrah Fawcett. And, well, as you might not appreciate this now, dear listener, he had probably one of the most recognisable faces on the planet. This guy was huge, although he always looks 
particularly short whenever they stand him next to his co-star Richard Anderson. The continuation of that line, are on, hides the jump cut and, at this point, the random three-digit numbers start appearing, overlaid in red over the bottom right-hand corner of the screen and appearing to be made out of those valve-based number displays that computers were still using before LEDs came in, despite what the 1950s Indiana Jones film might suggest. Think of the countdown timer in Goldfinger and you'll have more idea of the sort of thing I mean. The numbers seem meaningless. Plus 922, plus 993, plus 512, plus 256, plus 000, zero, zero minus 384, plus 000, zero, zero, plus 640, plus 255, but probably represent all those various computer codes that were constantly being bandied about when viewers had been following the moon landing broadcast during the previous three years. The same shot continues as Lee reacts, blinks, and looks down towards those numbers, and the soundtrack continues with one of those lines that school kids seem to enjoy endlessly quoting, at least in our playground. I'm coming forward with the side stick. <laughs> Whatever that means. Still, it is exciting, though, and as we cut away from our fearless hero to a red-tinted view of something highly engineered that possibly represents a pilot's eye view from the cockpit of an eye about to be lost, the soundtrack develops an urgency as engines start to whine, raising in crescendo to a more alarming pitch, and voices become more urgent as the looks good and the inevitable uh, Roger response swiftly changes to a more urgent I've got a blowout in damper three. A something terrible looking flares in our eye line, and alarmingly the view vibrates a little whilst the cold inevitability of those three digits change from a swift plus zero 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 to a plus two five six. We cut to a distant view of the stricken aircraft spinning in a wild trajectory thanks to a much damaged, muck covered, blue tinted piece of old NASA research film, all framed within the round cornered rectangle of a fake TV screen as that blood red radar screen returns, presumably to add some drama, whilst disguising just how battered that footage truly was. The numbers click incessantly, remorselessly, unemotionally. Minus 511, plus 761, plus 961, minus 961. Sometimes hidden by the red of that radar radar screen whilst the engine whine gets higher and higher and sounds more and more alarming and urgent. Another cut and the screen is now filled with that old cine film footage, the radar scope vanishing, the reflected cockpit lights returning as we focus totally with the blue halo surrounding the tiny spinning silver dart plummeting aircraft as it points towards the bottom right of our screen and presumably that hard hard ground that seems so far far away mere seconds ago. Meanwhile a voice calmly intones, get your pitch to zero and the numbers keep on switching, minus 144, minus 256, minus 001, plus 000, and our hero, with a slight edge of rising panic, responds, pitches out, cutting to the face of our hero as before, although he is moving about within the frame a little more now, and covered with that returning radar scope effect, plus 000, plus 752, minus 001, minus 136, I can't hold altitude, and the repetitive whoop of a persistent alarm starts sounding in the background, adding to the the general air of urgency the calm control voice offers correction alpha hold is off turn selectors emergency and the camera cuts from the face of our stricken astronaut leaving us with nothing but blackness those reflected control board lights and numbers and that inexorable radar scope and the number always the numbers plus zero zero plus seven five two minus zero zero one minus one three six plus five oh eight plus one two eight let's be honest those little red numbers keep on flashing up in seemingly random sequence in the same part of the screen throughout the rest of this only vanishing when the final freeze frame heaves into view and cuts with the radar scope overlay continuing to the series co-star looking as concerned as he ought to be at this moment of great peril with the actor's name in the same font and layout as our main lead also starring Richard Anderson playing our hero's boss, one Oscar Goldman, a role he would play in both this series and its spin-off, The Bionic Woman, a few years later and beyond. Uniquely, I believe, perhaps both he and his later co-star Martin E. Brooks would ultimately end up playing the same character in two primetime series on different channels when one of the shows jumped networks towards its end. As our hero begins to impart his famous not-to-be-last words... Flight can't, I can't hold it, she's breaking up, she's break. We cut back to his face, blurred by the vibrations within the cockpit, and we see a third, again blue-tinted view from somewhere behind his head as a helmet-wearing figure in some kind of ejector seat smashes his head against the shattering glass of a cockpit with the blazing brightness of the sky and the brutal inevitability of the approaching ground diagonally splicing the screen. We cut back to that long-lens, blue-blurred view of the aircraft. The radar scope blinks off again, returning almost immediately as we see the view of the back of the pilot's head. And once again, cutting to our hero, 
Nero's face still blurred, still struggling with the controls, the whine of those engines almost screaming, and the horrific cockpit's eye view of the ground approaching at a terrifying rate, and a jump cut to that once real aircraft rolling and tumbling across our screen with the addition of some quite astonishingly effect smashing and crunching and grinding noises of the sickening horrific impact. Somehow it's both worse and better that we know that this was a genuine failure of a genuine test aircraft and that the pilot actually walked away from the crash. And so the screen fades to white in that about to meet your make way that movies have, but no, instead it pulls away to reveal the surgical lights of an operating theatre and a team of surgeons struggling, presumably, to save this young man's life. A voice booms in from nowhere. Steve Austin, astronaut. As we jump cut to a close-up at the head of our hero, whose name we now know, although he's looking the worse for wear, he is unconscious in a hospital bed, his head bandaged and a tube up his nose. He is, as the voice continues to inform us as the screen cuts away to black from this intrusive moment, a man barely alive. Those words might be supposed to be stated by Dr. Rudy Wells, the genius cyberneticist responsible for the enhancement of our hero, as played by two long-lived actors, first Alan Oppenheimer and later Martin E. Brooks. We see a close-up of a heart monitor, the bleeps and pings of which are now added to the sound mix before cutting away as some blue computer screen-like text starts to type its way across a black screen before revealing the word classified in bright red or rather unfriendly capital letters which flash on and off a few times to remind us of this and all accompanied by the kind of ticking noises to let you know they're working hard that thankfully computers have got over making nowadays on the grounds that they'll they'd be bloody annoying in an office or home setting and still more technological bleeps and pings begin to tell us that we are in all world of very hard science indeed. The text cuts to some state-of-the-art animated graphics, a blue grid on a black background representing a human head and overlaid with those persistent heartbeat pulses from that heart monitor which, like those flashing red numbers, now remain persistently over the other images we see. The head graphic zooms out to a full screen, this time staying on screen for long enough for the diagram of a bionic eye to appear element by impressive element, unaccompanied on this occasion by yet more computer writing, and we cut to a fast zoom onto an x-ray plate of a human skull, and we mix to a very impressive artificial eye clutched in the ungloved fingers of an unseen surgeon which sparkles with a decidedly and appropriately artificial looking starburst effect to make it ping and gleam. We cut to a blue grid representation of an arm, as the diagram of what we are about to learn from the voiceover is a bionic arm, to accompany that presumably also bionic eye, starts to build its way across the screen, and the computer text pops in in a manner that would have been almost unreadable to our little eyes back then in the day to explain just what this thing actually is. This graphic sequence with its pops and whistles of a specific rattling sound effect representing computers in general, which would become increasingly familiar to viewers of American TV sci-fi, is also accompanied by the now iconic voiceover as spoken by Oscar Goldman, a statement almost as famous in its way as the ones introducing The Twilight Zone or Star Trek in the previous decade. This entire voiceover sequence starts, however, with the kind of everyday sexism that betrays the world as it simply was back then, and its assumption that everyone involved with this hugely expensive top-secret, presumably military project, would obviously be a man. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. A line which, again, might be one of the few quotes that might be used to identify this specific decade in Western culture, unless you count the next one. We have the technology, which might be even more iconic in retrospect, even with its underlying braggadocio of the mighty United States of America being top dog at doing that sort of thing back in those times. Of course, all of the transistors, insulated wires and valves we get to see contained within the artificial body parts that we're about to see do suggest a slight ignorance of the miniaturization that was going on in Japan and other places around the world at this time, but the props do look impressive, even if we now understand just quite how impractical they might actually have been. The picture cuts back to the lights burning as that surgical team are working on their work in progress. As Oscar continues, we have the capability to make the world's first bionic man. A prop arm is passed between surgeons and across some x-ray plates showing a hand, and we cut to a close-up of that very same arm lifting a stack of weights in a gymnasium. Steve Austin will be that man. We return to more artificial computer graphic animations, which do remind me a lot of the sequences made for the BBC television version of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, by the way, to see the diagram of Steve's artificial legs drawing themselves, as Oscar assures us that he will be better than he was before, which is obviously open to some ethical debate, as we cut to a close-up on an electronic lower leg being worked on with a surgical clamp, cutting again to a wider shot showing us his foot and a lot of surgical instruments, and finally to those legs on a treadmill running, as Oscar reassuringly continues better, stronger, faster, 
And as the theme tune starts to ramp up and a rising tonal sound adds to the acceleration effect and the heartbeat graphic overlaid changes to something far different, more high-tech and punchier looking and which, like those ever-changing little red numbers, will now hang around until the final freeze frame. The treadmill legs moving impossibly fast cut to a wide view of the face of our hero, Steve Austin, on the same treadmill, running in a blue tracksuit, with a computer sitting churning out presumably incredible printouts behind him, and a cut to a close-up of what is presumably a speedometer on the treadmill informs us that his speed is now an incredible 58, no, 59, no, 60 miles an hour. We cut again to a wide shot of a presumably suitably impressed scientist watching four TV screens displaying Steve Austin doing some road work now in his red tracksuit, and as we cut to a full screen image of the image that was on the top right screen we see Steve running in the series trademark slow motion way overlaid with moving trees shot from a moving vehicle and moving in the opposite direction as the theme music soars ramped up to its fullest exhilarating mightiness and we get a different view now framed with that same round cornered rectangle mass that earlier displayed the crashing aircraft of real time Steve running astonishingly fast in some speeded up film before we cut to that final freeze frame title card of Steve Austin in his red tracksuit with the series title and a massive lens flare which remains one of the most familiar images in television history. Not bad for a silly bit of sci-fi hokum from the 1970s. That 1 minute and 25 seconds is just about as fabulous a sequence of editing and building excitement that there's ever been, and is an object lesson in building a title sequence that has rarely, if ever, been matched in the several decades since it first appeared. Its most famous variant, the one we've been examining today, was used from the second series onwards. The first season uses a slightly different voiceover and that gets tweaked again later in the run, but this version I believe is the one most remembered by the generation that first saw it. The main titles for the spin-off series The Bionic Woman, played by the darling of my school year, the delightful Lindsay Wagner, used pretty much the same accident, cyber graphics, exciting real-world demonstrations of her new abilities structure as the parent series, albeit filmed in a slightly more romantic style uh, to reflect her femininity or some such 1970s nonsense, but somehow failed to be anything like as iconic, although the blue grid representation of what was obviously the then still mysterious female form had a lot of my classmates paying very close attention indeed. The reunion movie several years later failed almost completely to update the titles in any meaningful way and actually managed to be almost as ghastly as the original was wonderful, but in a horrifically 1980s way. Finally, we must give an honourable mention to the sub-James Bond style of the titles used on two of the three pilot movies that were produced before the first series, which use exciting scenes from the TV movies accompanied by a song sung by Dusty Springfield, which deserves to be heard simply because it's almost impossible to believe that these could ever have been considered appropriate for the series once you compare them with this most iconic of title sequences. <laughs> Steve, what is it? What's wrong? I was hoping you could tell me. He's alive. He lost an arm, two legs, and one eye. But he's alive. I'm not sure he'd want to live if he can't be the man he was. What if he could be more than the man he was? We have the technology to rebuild him. I want it done no matter what the cost. So there we are, the opening titles to The Six Million Dollar Man, dissembled. I still think they're superb and well worth a quick look next time you're browsing the internet. If you do, usually you'll be exposed to a whole host of other exciting and iconic title sequences from an era when they truly were works of art. And maybe, if you enjoyed this one, I might come back and look at another one some other time. Take care.
Many thanks to Martin for yes, that. Yes, thank you, Martin. Interesting to apply Martin's skills in yes, real life to uh, to this silly old thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. But yes, I mean, six million dollar man never really watched. No. So I'm no. not not even sort of that familiar with the title no. sequence. No. No, I sort of am, but yeah, I, I it's not my kind of program. Oh, here comes Rose. Hello, yeah. Rose. Are you going to help? Scrabbling. Okay. Uh, moving on now, mm-hmm. Paul and Nick return to look at. Armchair Thriller. Hello, Round the Archives listeners. It's me, Paul Chandler otherwise known as Shy Yeti, you, you've heard my voice before. <laughs> um, well, this time, uh, this is the first part of a, a two-part article all about the series Armchair Thriller, and I've, I've got Nick Goodman here with me as my Hello. armchair thriller expert. So, uh, uh-huh. yes. So, we, we, as, you, as we were going to discuss the whole series, we thought we'd do it in uh, two articles as there were two seasons. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think there's principally that I think there's two reasons for that really is one is I'm very enthusiastic about the show I, I've uh, top five or ten favorite shows ever I think and also I, I, I sort of watched it from beginning to end when it was first televised also I've been promising it, prom, prom, bleh, promising it to uh, Andrew and Lisa for about three or four years now quite pretty well nearly as long as RTA has been going so uh, I thought it was high time I sort of called in and uh, did, did the did, did a, a full-blooded version yeah as far as the two seasons go the first season well it, it, it would appear to be more um, less troubled than, than what was going on in season two um, am, I, yes. am I right yeah Yes, I mean, I have to say, to start with, I, I think obviously it's a quite, a, quite a lot of RTA uh, readers, or the readers, listeners, will be quite familiar with Armchair Theatre, which preceded it. But um, in actual fact, um, this is, it was commissioned by Verity Lambert, who, until I read her, autobi- her biography, I had absolutely no idea how many shows she commissioned. So this was about the time of Rock Follies. Um, and she sort of seemed to get the sort of thriller had just finished, and of course Armchair Theatre had just finished. It was almost as if she glued the two together to make Armchair Thriller. Yeah, um, yeah. And Robert Bank, uh, this is just a little bit of background detail. Robert Bank Stewart, uh, familiar also with Doctor Who um, fans, as you know, the writer of two very popular Tom Baker stories. Um, was the script editor on the on the first series, and Robert Holmes, even bigger name in Doctor Who fandom, was the second. Uh, so, and both, in my view, both were excellent. You know, were excellently handled. I think it it's basically a, th- a serialized thriller se- uh, anthology series with a bit like Doctor Who two part. Um, sorry, yeah, uh, f- four parters and six parters. Yeah, the first series has five stories there's a four-parter a six-parter a four-parter and then two more six-parters um and um yeah it ran from the 21st of february 78 till the 18th of may 78 did did you see them all live or i almost yes are we talking about just series one yeah yes um yeah series one i saw all as as far as i recall I saw everything but the last episode of the third story, which was a, 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 the girl who walked quickly. They're, they're basically, they were a combination of um, specially commissioned scripts and adapted from books that, um, in the most cases, were fairly recently uh, published. But um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so you've got uh, the four parter, uh, six parter, four parter, uh, two six parters. Um, but um yeah i saw the thing going right back to the beginning i thought i think because i was trying to racking my brains all week because i knew i'd be doing this trying to kind of zero in on why i chose to watch it first time round because it was about eight o'clock at night of course i suppose i would have gone to bed about nine uh, because i was nine when it went out and um i suppose i was always interested in kind of thrilly chilly kind of 
um, exciting things. And um, so not a, the, the whole, you know, the, the, the whole title. I probably would have seen the title music and titles music, a uh, title sequence, which was, um, to, you know, wonderfully eerie. And of course, it had the the um, behind uh, the, as an intro. It had a dark and spooky version of the Thames um, intro <laughs> yeah. uh, theme. Um, so it, the first episode went out on the 21st of February. Now, the other thing is, um, playing a very sinister role in the first story, that is, is Rachel in Danger by John Bowen, was Stephen Greif, uh, who had just, I mean, Blake's, the first series of Blake was being shown at, the, at that time. And of course, again, as with Armchair, I was watching it from the first episode onwards and became a fan. And so I would have, two of, this was the day after Jewel went out, so I would have seen two episodes of which I d distinctly remember watching them. But uh, there was I would have seen two episodes with Stephen Greif already, so he was very very fresh in my mind. Um, so I was I was interested to see him in this, um, and I just I, the whole thing was just a wonderfully. It's the old thing of I suppose going back to Hitchcock. Um, ordinary people in extraordinary situations and because there's a child involved in this first one and there's there's an element of jeopardy all the way through um it's just a wonderfully macabre um and what, what time of I, evening was it shown i'm Doing fairly that? certain yes i'm fairly certain it went out at eight o'clock Mm -hmm. um, which was eight o'clock, half past eight, and I usually knocked off to bed about nine. So I was allowed to watch it. Um, as I've probably said before, and looking back, my parents were wonderfully uncensorary um, in terms of what I watched. They, no, no, I don't remember them ever saying, "Don't watch this; it's too frightening," or "Don't do this." Um, I always managed to freak out myself first <laughs> before I did anything. Um, but I'll get on to that later. But that, yeah, neat four-parter. John Bowen, I have to say, will go on to write two of my other two favourites for the series. I think he just hit the ground running with Rachel in Danger. It's a, a, a lovely production. And also, because it was Verity Lambert uh, producing it, there's lots of jobs for the boys. Warris Hussein actually directs that first story. Yes, I was going. I noticed that. I was going to say, is that a coincidence or was that a deliberate thing? Do you think? I, 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 more likely than it I've was a, a deliberate thing. Probably. Yeah, <laughs> I would not be the least bit. It's a bit of a coincidence that Verity is involved, and they were still very good friends from their Doctor Who days. He was already. He had since Unearthly Child. Of course, he'd become a very established, respected director, and um, he had. I think he had just done, or was just about to do, Edward and Mrs. Simpson. Um, and indeed, when I met Warris Hussein 10 years ago at the Marco Polo event, I chose not to bring up Doctor Who, but I brought Rachel in Danger, which had been now... Uh, all the armchairs sort of started emerging on DVD 2008, um, and I brought it to, in, it to him instead. I thought, well, here's a guy who's had to work work from the you know the bottom up to, to gain respect, and, and I just wanted to acknowledge the, that he had done... I acknowledge his work other than just Doctor Who. Um, and he said, oh, yes. <laughs> and um, I think um, uh, Ali has spoken to Stephen Greif about it as well, because, I mean, she's watched it with me many times. And it was just, I was so pleased. I, I, I've, there has been some armchair thrillers I've seen since, uh, you know, even before the official releases. This is the first one I'd seen. So literally there was 30 years uh, between seeing, you know, one uh, the, me, me seeing the first season and the first uh, and seeing the DVDs, and I was not disappointed. W Warriors has got a, has a nice amount of film location work. Um, this is McCluskey, aka Gwyneth Powell's in it. Um, there's uh, interestingly enough, there's a guy called David Cook, who was the first presenter on Rainbow alongside the very scary original Bungle, <laughs> and um, he plays a sort of quizzling character in in sort of in a sort of who, who gets a conscience you know with this particular terrorism organization uh it's a nice little role and um he I, I, looking at wiki he was actually the partner of john bowen um he's he's he, john, david cook's dead now but john bowen i believe is still with us and there's nearly a there's a good 16 year age gap there so that's interesting 
But uh, yes, it's quite nice he got a party for him in the show. But excellent story and very satisfying end twist. And there is a lot, I think it must have been filmed around the summer of 77 because there's a lots of very patriotic um, garden parties, one of which with, with the Queen was supposed to be in. And so I think they probably used a lot of footage. They did a lot of footage from around that time. I imagine there was a lot of that kind of thing going on in the summer of 77. But yeah, um, so it, yeah, it got me hooked. And there's an, a, an end which is both satisfying and disconcerting, which is, for me, is the series uh, which would go on to be the series at its best. So um, I think that was, that was an, uh, yeah. Love, lovely, lovely story, and I'd, I'd recommend it for, uh, wholeheartedly. And, and of course, that was an original script, so um, uh, as opposed to an adaption. Uh, listeners, I should say that uh, I think Nick showed me all of these, but it's been in, been a <laughs> while, so um, it'll, the article will mainly be Nick's um, memories because he's seen it a lot more recently. But there are a couple of stories in season two, a couple of stories as we talk that that. Um, uh, I have memories of, but uh, from watching them, not I, I didn't watch any of them at the time. It's slightly, slightly too early for me. But uh, um, do you want to? Have you more to say on Rachel and Danger? Or would you like to move on to the I, next? I one? think that's it. Um, only to say that, uh, like you say, I, I have shown them all to you. But uh, like you also say, um, it was a wee while ago. There was a few that we've watched more recently. But yes, yes. Um, my, I can clearly remember watching a lot of uh, them with you. Uh, Cleveland Flats, which of course we left t- 11 years ago. Mm. Uh, I think probably nearish when the DVD releases came out. Yes. Um, I, and um, but I, I, there's a few I remember watching at the ne- our next home, um, and of course some we've watched much more recently. Um, but so yeah, some of them might might bob. You know, if I me- if I mention them and, and what they like, some of them might bob back into your memory. Um, but uh, I, I couldn't quite understand you being a bit vague after all this time. <laughs> so the next story was uh, A Dog's Ransom. Yes. That was a six-parter. This Tuesday at 8.30 on ITV, a new armchair thriller. A childless couple's life is disrupted when their dog goes missing in the park. Go on, dog. Go on, Gina, fetch it. Come on, Gina. Come on now, dog. You can't find it. You can't find it. She she never came back. I can't find her. Tina. Good dog. Tina. Come here, Tina. <laughs> a missing dog brings terror and intrigue to the lives of its owners. Money changes hands for a dog's ransom. The Armchair Thriller, this Tuesday at 8.30 on ITV. Yes. Um, now, this we can touch upon uh, things here because um, it's adapted from a book by Patricia Highsmith, uh, who you are actually much more of an authority on in terms of, you know, because you've read a lot, lot more of her books. I actually have the book of Dog's Ransom. It took me a while to try and sit down. I've made a note, I've made a sort of effort to, over the years, to actually track down the original books of the stories because I, I, I'm always curious to see how things are adapted. Um, now, again, I, I, I obviously wasn't previously aware of the book at the age of nine. Dog's Ransom, again, is a nice, very, very nice example of the show because it, it's got a, a sort of fairly um, innocuous, well, not innocuous crime, but a fairly small time crime of the kidnap of dog. But from that event, it grows and grows and grows. And the, pro- the problem, because of people's differing way of dealing with the situation and a certain amount of bigotry, uh, from there, I say the police force along the way, uh, the situation grows and grows and gets out of hand. And it's intriguing to see it, it, it sort of naturally kind of flows, but you know, there's no, the, 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 it isn't an easy clear cut situation. It's very dark and it's, and, and the character, the lead characters who, uh, I think quite deliberately go from g- getting a sympathy to kind of Oh come on! You know you you want you want to sort of um, give them a bit of a slap sometimes, but um, at the same time you want them to get get through. And some of them don't get through, which is you know all part of the. I like that kind of uncertainty. Um, one thing about the adaptation now, when I read it, I it was the, of course the original book set in Manhattan, and the names some of the names are changed. Some of them are, some of them aren't, uh, and of course it's a very Sweeney-ish 
um, type of uh, police force that you see in the TV one, whereas it's a very Manhattan type of police force you see in the uh, um, on, in the book. Now, I didn't looking at it. I didn't think it was a bad adaptation. It was a clever idea to actually um, readapt it over for, for for the British, or you know, to to make it um, a kind of like a British version. Um, but our friend Phil Newman. Um, who is a, a great, you know, greatly likes the original book, doesn't think it is a good adaption. Um, so I've, that's interesting. I'm, I'm quite, you know, it's quite um, in, interesting differing views there, but I, I, I didn't think it was bad adaption. Yeah, ironically, um, I have read a lot of Patricia Highsmith books. Um, she does a lot of psychological thrillers. Um, she does the, the, she did the talented Mr Ripley but there were other books in the Ripley series. Uh, and she just did short stories, and uh, I've, I've got quite a lot of them to read, and uh, Dog's Ransom is, is one of them. She, I think she was quite prolific, really, but, uh, but that's not one that I've yeah. got to yet, although, of course, I have yeah. seen the adaption. Yes. I mean... Um, I remember sitting when obviously I remember when it was first televised, particularly a frightening performance from Leon Eagles, who has been he's done Doctor Who, Tomorrow People. Um, he was he went on to be our friend Gareth and Sarah's drama teacher, and he plays a very vicious Polish character in this. Who sort of caught and I remember I know that our friend Andrew Dexter has memories of this story, and particularly his performance in it. You know, it's uh, the, the the whole thing about victim and perpetrator gets quite blurred and it's quite clever. You were saying about psychological uh, thriller. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly what this is. It's not a straightforward good v evil. There's ambiguity on all sides and, and I, I, I like that. Um, you, you kind of, there's a part of you that wants everything to be right and be clear cut, but there's another part of you that appreciates that it's not. Mm. <laughs> so um. it's, I, yeah. According to my information, um, it was one of her, well, uh, late mid-period books, perhaps. It was written in 72, uh, so a while after the... Um, although I think with uh, the Ripley book, she wrote those between 55 and 91. So, yeah, that, that was sort of... Dogs Fanson was somewhere in the middle of that series, but amongst, um, you know, a, a lot of her... Yeah, she did do quite a lot, um, but uh, yeah, in- interesting. Um, but oh, um, also among the cast, Paul Angelis, uh, brother of um, Michael Angelis from the Liver Birds, uh, playing a very nasty CID man. Um, you've got Benjamin Whitrow, um, who has been in loads and loads of things, um, and uh, he, he's quite—he uh, he turns in quite a nice performance. Um, and you've also got David, ooh, what's his name? I can't remember his name. He, he plays another CID, David Hargreaves, that's right. Plays another CID man, better known as the Phantom Raspberry Blur, rolled London Town in the, in the, in the uh, t- two Ronnies. Um, but no, uh, it's, it's, it's a lovely, it's, it's a lovely story. And um, again, directed by John Bowen, who seems to, he just knows how to do the unease, which was uh, and the macabre side of it, which is part of the, uh, the whole um, thing of of, of, of um, armchair thriller, which I liked. Um, but again, six parts, and I remember watching it with you, and th- and you, we got to the end of episode four, and you th- and you were saying you really didn't know how the story was going to sort of continue from there, which is for my for my to my mind exactly what we should be thinking um you know to say for a good for a good good drama um it should it should keep you on your toes so um if you're ready to move on to the next yep. um serial it was called the girl who walked quickly a four-parter directed by yeah. brian directed by brian farnham and written and, by ray uh, jenkins uh, Yes, Ray Jenkins. Um, uh, some of you will know as the regular regular writer on Callan. Um, so he he's he's well very well established with thrillers, very meaty kind of Londony based thrillers. Um, again, like Rachel and Danger, it's it touches upon terrorism, but in a very different way. 
um, Don, Dennis Lawson, who plays the the young guy in it, is is sort of spirited away by a terrorist gang and sort of brainwashed in some very very kind of alarming psychedelic kind of ways. And um, again, there's some nice location work um, in the the London Underground. And in fact, there's one scene in episode two where Dennis Lawson goes through the underground, which unlike with Web of Fear, you're actually allowed to film down. And um, they, he go past a Star Wars poster because it would have been it w- went out in March, April seventy eight, and so it probably would have been filmed sort of December seventy seven, January seventy eight when Star Wars was just about to hit Britain. And of course, Dennis Lawson's in Star Wars, so I I, I often wonder whether that was a little in joke on on their part, just a uh, oh uh, quick plug <laughs> for my film. Um, and so uh, yeah, it's it's another one. It's um, again, it's. It's an unusual drama. It's not, as I say, it's, it doesn't quite have that sort of deeper um, psychological edge to it. The, 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 the characters don't quite grab you in the same way as the other two do. But it's still a damn good four-part piece of um, tension. And I, it is, I have to say, I sacrificed the last episode in 1978 because my mum took me to see The Rescuers. Um, now, in those days... We had experimented a few years before with tape recording um, epic stories of TV that we didn't have. Obviously, video recorders were, well, they were the round, but they were, my, there was no way my dad would have considered buying one or any, even renting one. Um, but he, we, um, I, I, we used to write down what was, I, whoever was behind uh, at home, we used to write down the events. Uh, we did it for mum did it for horror of fang rock episode four when i went to see spy you love me uh we did it for jen on i think part one of invasion of time doctor who um and with this i i think it was jen stayed behind and wrote down the events so i knew roughly speaking what had happened but um re- watching it for the first i think it was the subject of one of my very first facebook statuses and uh in 2008 you know i'm watching the last episode of girl of walk quickly for, for the first time after after 30 years of missing it um so uh and it's it's a very weird one it's it's very it's a kind of claustrophobic and also very visual so i'm glad they didn't do an audio of it because it, it wouldn't have made a it, 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 i wouldn't have made a scooby-doo of it um people to watch out for is barry stanton the the sort of gingery uh burly guy with a beard who appears in heavies and everything um and was a jacondon in the uh twin dilemma uh you've got clive merrison one of one of two um armchair thriller roles he's got as a as a teacher um and yeah, as i say various familiar faces but yeah nice I said a little bit leaves a few question marks at the end, uh, which are kind of yeah. But what about so and so and so and so? Um, but the end is is weird enough to, to to sort of satisfy for the most part. But I think it's it's probably my least favourite up to this point, uh, which is why I think I, I, one wonders if I'd if I'd been I would have been so keen to have jettisoned um, one of the other two. Um, had it not, you know, I, I just, I don't know. What was interesting is it would, it, they would, they went out twice weekly. They went out on a Thursday and a, a Tuesday and a Thursday. Uh, well, I think, I think they did. Yes, yeah, yeah, they must have done. Yeah, um, and um, so Mum took me to see the rescuers on a Thursday, and I don't think it was even half term. So, or was it? I can't remember that. Such a long time ago. So it would have been, yes, it would have been the sort of like the fourth of no, the sixth of April. That, it's um, almost so Easter holidays. Uh, it, is, it is actually. Maybe, maybe it was Easter holidays, uh, but I, it's rather unusual to take uh, take me out to the cinema on a on a on a school night. So, <laughs> but anyway, um, that was that was a that was one I enjoyed catching up with on the one that upon the DVD releases, and it's all in a nice girly pink um, <laughs> DVD cover. Um, but yeah, good stuff. So- the, the the fourth story is probably one of the most famous ones, isn't it? It's um, uh, it is quite, without quite a doubt, a, yeah, yeah, quite as a nun. Uh, six episodes, directed by Moira Armstrong, written by Julia Jones, but it's based on a novel by Antonia Fraser. Um, a very recent novel, actually. I have yes. it here. Um, it's the only one I actually, um, due to my own sort of being distracted by other things, it's the only one I haven't actually read of the 
uh, armchair thriller that, that were adapted. It was actually published in 77. And we can surmise that production, adaption and everything was possibly even some of the recording was actually done in 77. So it really was hot off the press. So one wonders if, uh, of course, Julia Jones is a quite established director. So maybe it was a sort of girly old school tie thing there where they met at a party and said, oh, I got this thriller. And oh, because it's got, you know, it's got, got lots of juicy ingredients in it. It is, as you say, pretty well the most famous of the armchair thrillers because everybody who saw it um, remembers the black nun um i'm, <laughs> I'm not talking about what we call but um uh, I, it, it's um yeah the, the nun with no face um it was a cliffhanger what well, the most famous cliffhanger um halfway through the story you've got um or you also have a very familiar figure in jemima shaw uh, later famous for the sh show Jemima Shaw Investigates. Uh, only then she was played by Patricia Hodge, and here she's played by Maria Aitken. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it takes a little while to get in. Um, th probably, the, f f I mean, I'm, I don't count myself as one of them, but for some of them who, who some you know, if people like a slam bang, thank you, ma'am, kind of roller coaster of a you know thing that lots of fast pace and everything um probably it's it's probably a little bit too leisurely um but it's got a it's got a nice mystery to it and and some very creepy work in a real chapel so um and, and also from a personal point of view it's nice to see the nuns in it aren't all strict bigots and and you know they're, they're actually quite cuddly characters and you've got dear old Sylvia Coleridge, who's the little old lady in absolutely everything. Um, one season ahead of her daughter, actually, who appears in series two. Um, and um, yeah, there's a lovely bit, which is a bit like uh, Beatrix Lemon in um, uh, Stones of Blood, where she says at the end, uh, to, oh, do you think we could have another adventure, Jemima? <laughs> and I thought, like, oh. <laughs> but no, uh, great. And again, um, the characters are very human. They, the, the lead character is having an affair and not with a particularly nice bloke either, you know. <laughs> but, um, and um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's all good stuff. And there's a very young Patsy Kensett who, um, I, ca I can say this non-pervy because I, I'm five months younger than her. Um, I, I had a, a, a big crush on at the time. She was in a ser another series a few months earlier called The Foundation, where she plays somebody's daughter. Uh, so she was always a bit, of, she was already a bit of a pin-up for me. So uh, she plays one of the convent gals. Um, and uh, so, yeah, good, good, good stuff. And yeah, I, I remember it all. I remember it all <laughs> from when it was first televised. Uh, but I really must get round to reading the book sometime. Yeah, I should probably uh, rewatch that one with you next time um, we get to oh, meet up. Lovely. Yeah. Um, now, the fifth and final story of this series uh, is called The Limbo Connection, another six parter directed by Robert Tronson and um, also written by Philip Mackay. Uh, I also have some facts here. Apparently, um, the first episode, to sort of show you how well it was doing, uh, the first episode got 17 million viewers. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think by... I mean, it was five stories in. It was starting to get... Uh, I think it was starting to get a quite respectful... Um, audience um and you've got you know you as well as you you've you've got a name in pretty well every story and you've got james bolan here who was riding very high after well not just like lads that finished by them but when the boat comes in uh you've got christopher benjamin who's a, just a marvelous character actor as the inspector um yeah it's a conspiracy theory basically um i've got the original book by derry quinn um not too bad in that it's sort of to make things flow a bit better, they've rearranged things in a slightly more coherent order. They've brought in that's a wonder mentioning Beatrix Lemon again, just pre Stones of Blood. Um, she plays an, a, a drunken old woman who sort of helps them out. And there's some wonder, there's the wonderful business going on there. One almost imagines she really is pissed. Um, and um, again, you've got in the lead character. And I think James Bowden's particularly good at this because he doesn't he doesn't really play sympathetic characters all that well. And so he's actually quite he's actually quite very unlikable in the first episode. You think, oh, where are we going with this? Do we are we actually going to end, end up liking? But he he 
sort of he's not particularly nice to his wife uh, but he when his wife goes missing you can actually see the distance you know the, the the distance he'll go to to actually see that she's all right or check that she's all right so you, you again you kind of build your journey with the characters which is quite nice it's philip mackie as as the adapter was known the year before for um, his adaption of the Raffles stories, which mm-hmm. is another great favourite of mine. So he, he adapted all the Raffles into TV mm-hmm. and is the grandfather of Pearl Mackey, who was a Doctor Who companion with um, P- Peter Capaldi. Mm. Um, so uh, um, one looking at the dates, uh, alas, they never met because he died two years before she was born. So I think she, he died in 85 um but uh, yeah a splendid adaption um there's a lot of i I mean for me there's a there's a a wee bit of sort of um breaking into thinking and getting caught breaking into thinking and getting caught you know so maybe it's it's one of the six parties that maybe it's a teeny bit of a stretch um but it's this it, as a conspiracy story it's worth the worth the stretch it doesn't quite keep the, the attention as much as dog's ransom um but it's good stuff apparently um philip mackey also wrote um the script for the naked civil servant um he did indeed yes yeah, um, um, a, year, a year or two before immensely respected um screenwriter uh, as i say I've, I've very keen on and we also we were given us a, a series from 1972 called the department uh which was written by philip mackey um which we sat down and watched i'd never heard of it neither had ali and uh, it was very very good um, we we enjoyed it it's got people like donald sinden in it and um you know bernard hepton and it's amusing as well as kind of dramatic so um he's he's a writer i've got immense respect for um and uh, Limbo is, and it's it's the first of one of two Derry Quinn adaptions. Um, I think Derry Quinn, I've got his, I've got the 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 book of Limbo connection here. Um, I think he started. He actually went into script writing. Well, he went into novel novel writing quite late. So he was born in nineteen twenty two. Uh, Limbo connection is actually his first published work, mm. and um, I think that it came out in nineteen seventy six. There we go first published in 1976 so in actual fact it was only about a year or two you know not even two years old when they adapted it so um they get they get they got some stuff i think dogs ransom obviously was a bit older but not that much um they, they obviously had some you know people the robert bank stewart whoever selected the stories obviously had their ear to the ground as to the very latest um kind of uh, story you know the things that were coming out so um well done to him and it, it was a good it was a fairly good end to the se- into the series because you know there's a lot of things to tie up at the last episode um and of course yes as you say at the beginning where there was it's a fairly un- it was a fairly un- it seems to be a fairly untroubled season i would love to read uh more about the whole production and the you know the whole the way it was built up i love the andrew pixley kind of everything but the kitchen sink uh, yeah. production notes yeah, we are, sp- I lo- I love- we are yeah. spoilt we are spoilt being Doctor Who fans that, that there's so much yes. out there documenting and then you go to other series I've said this before you go to other series yeah. and you just want to know quite basic things and there's nothing nothing about them yes. uh, so, I know uh, I, 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 I just think oh yes no. you know there's because I, I I lived through the time when they were when they were made I kind of think you know you look at Limbo Connection and you think oh there's snow on the ground oh mm. ah, right when in the beginning of 78 yeah. was there snow on the ground and, and indeed there was um, mm. round about the time Rachel in Danger went out there was a snowstorm i remember a, a, a snowman i made in the back garden and the fact that we were sent home from school and i thought oh i wonder if that was made around then, that time and then you think you know it's obviously very wintry in in um uh quiet as none you think oh i wonder if that was made around christmas time or same way as with um, rachel in danger it's just the anal retentive way my mind works you know i just think oh when when was that made when how did they get involved you know and um going back to verity uh, the very inception of it um it turns out that her best friend um was andrew brown who actually created armchair thriller so he actually created it for her they were very very good friends he's dead now but they were very very good friends apparently 
and um he and he yeah it's interesting he he actually created the whole series and then i think he adapted the later one which we'll mm. we'll get to a bit later but mm. um but yes he so it's jobs for the boys and uh, her husband actually directed two of uh, the series two ones um which mm. is again it's it's a it, little it, 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 mm. intriguing sort of developments well, I'm afraid we're going to have to um, leave it there for this time. But, listeners, we will be back with um, a, a detailed conversation about Series 2 of Armchair Thriller. Um, if not next time, then very soon. That's OK. There's a, there's a bit... There's two years to wait, unfortunately, in, in total, because uh, that, <laughs> this sort of went out... Uh, the, the last episode went out in May 78, and you had to wait till January 80 before the new set of stories was... Uh, available yeah. uh, maybe we might be off to st- strike the surface of that next time because I, I, I there's a mystery there which yeah. I don't know the answer to so maybe somebody might mm. be able to enlighten me uh, out 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay well thanks Nick Pleasure. we'll be back again soon and uh, yeah I'm handing back to Andrew and Lisa Thank you to Paul and Nick, who will return. Yes, they will. Yes. Right. Only one more thing to do, and that's mm-hmm. episode 51, done and indeed dusted. Yes. So, Andrew and Lisa, now take a look at... Captain Zepp, Space Detective. of law verification and inquiry you are about to watch one of our famous crime detection adventures and you will then be challenged to spot the clues and to solve the crime yourselves so watch carefully and take notes or you may well miss some vital evidence and now to introduce this week's adventure is Sol's leading detective students please welcome captain zeck Good afternoon, Lisa. Good afternoon, Andrew. So the question is, what is Captain Zepp? Captain Zepp is a children's television programme. It's a sort of whodunit for kids. In in space. In space. And, yeah, the hero of it, or the main character, is Captain Zepp. Mm -hmm. Played in series one by Paul Greenwood and series two by Richard Morant. And he investigates crimes with the assistance of... um, Jason Brown, who's like the junior partner, and Professor Spyro in Series 1 and Professor Varna in Series 2. Yeah. Who does the spacey, intelligent <laughs> spouting. Who's the science. She's the science bird. The science bird. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> but what do you think of Captain Z then? I quite like it, yeah. 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 Um, series 2 feels more better written yeah. than Series 1 because um, Series 1's written by Dick Hills, who's the... Um, creator yeah. of it and Dick Hill's ex of Morecambe and of Wise Morecambe and Wise and various other things and um, Tell Me Another and things like that he seems a strange choice to do a space series yes. but I know I notice he did get a credit on the space episode of 321 okay so right you know. um, but yeah he's he, it feels like he's writing more comedic stories mm. where in series 2 when all the stories are written by Colin Bennett mm-hmm. who is Mr. Bennett from um, Take Heart, Take Heart and Heartbeat, and Heartbeat, the caretaker. Heartbeat, not to be confused with Heartbeat. Yes, um, he seems to be writing more intelligently for the kids and treating them like, like what, like they're more intelligent, mm-hmm. really. 
There's a more of an ecological um, storyline in series two. Although I have to say, Dick Hills does get the old bit of proper science yeah. in. Because the explanation of like a laser beam, for example, mm-hmm. is, is quite yeah. good. I quite like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it, it's uh, produced by Christopher Pilkington. Yes. And it's one of those names that I sort of half recognised. Mm-hmm. Then I started to look through uh, BBC Genome. Now, episode one of series one mm-hmm. is 5th of January 1983. Yes. Um, which is the same night as Arc of Infinity uh, part two, mm. you might like to know. The listings are uh, 425 Jack and Ori with Tom Conti, mm-hmm. uh, 440 Take Heart, yes. Cave Paintings, Mud Hut, Snails, An Old Boot, A Futuristic City, and A Naked Tortoise. Well, frankly, that sounds like a plot from Captain Zap. <laughs> Naked but, Tortoise. But produced by Christopher Pilkington. Okay. So he produces Take Heart. There's mm-hmm. a break for news round with Paul McDowell and mm-hmm. Captain Zepp, episode one, is on at ten past five. Okay. So it says, it is the year 2095. The student space detective of, of Solve Academy are in training. Captain Zepp, the most famous space detective of all time. <laughs> is there much competition for well, that? I guess so. there can't be that many space detectives. Super space detectives. Shows the students a video of a famous crime, a case taken from the files of Solve HQ. Then the interrogation begins. Can the students answer his searching questions? And can you at home? I'm pointing at you at home now. It's not your pointing. Stay alert. I was supposed to point again. (laughs) And take notes. Even after the the video ends and the criminals are caught, there are solved badges to be won for those who watch carefully. Mm -hmm. Uh, Case number one, death on Delos. Mm. Well, Delos was um, Ian's mate from um, yeah, the, Romans, the Romans, but I'm sure yeah. nobody dies on him. Uh, Captain Zepp in his spaceship, Zepp-1, answers an urgent call to save the lives of the gentle plant people of the planet Delos. Did you say they've got tashes? Yeah, one's got like, he's like got a big proper sort of handlebar, sort of Jimmy Edwards type <laughs> moustache. Even though he's a plant. Even though he's a plant. There's him, and then... Cause they they introduce the characters mm. and all of we should say all of the backgrounds and the characters in the stories are all drawings yeah and and they're basically on a blue screen yeah because ray ogden is graphic yeah. designer and, although you do get some other illustrators credited yeah. as well and they're acting to nothing so you get all these and they introduce the characters and it's fine they go like well, this is president whatever or yeah whatever. But then you get to it and you can't tell who's who. And by the time you got to about the fourth one, you've forgotten you anyway. Forgot yeah. The first one is, yeah. Because yeah. so, you've got a sort of a three different people doing the voices. Yeah. Well, Sheila Grant's one of them, you know, does the voice of the Crocs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's a little confusing. Didn't you say Colin Bennett gets to do Colin some voices Bennett, that's in, some, season in season two? two yes. Yeah. But season one runs Death on Delos, The Lodestone of Space, mm-hmm. The Plague of Santos. The G and R one four seven factor. That sounds. Oh, that's that's, that, that's the Nobby Clark one. Yeah, that, that's that's the one where they've run out of space names and yeah. they've just got like Nobby Clark and, and Dennis Price and Jock and Jock. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's, and, it, and one's just got one name. There's another one that's just got one name. It's like they couldn't think of a surname. Yeah, the Tin Men of Coza. Mm. That, that's it, obviously involving robots and the Warlords of Armageddon. Yes. I mean, they all a bit sound like sort of rejected Doctor Who titles, mm-hmm. don't they? You can imagine, like, Jerry Davis rejecting yes. them as silly no. titles. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's... I mean, the, the contrast between the two seasons is is, is interesting. They're, they're close enough to be, you know, recognisable as the same show. Yeah. But then, of course, you do have the problem that Paul Greenwood... But, you know, originally best known as Rosie, I yes. guess, at this point, the mm-hmm. policeman from the Roy Clark series um i don't know quite why he leaves i don't know if he leaves or if he's just not available or they just decide to get a new captain's head yeah maybe he wanted too much money for the second series <laughs> to get somebody cheaper but they do say they do say that um i i take up my duties as captain zepp yes um, so it's like captain zepp is, is it, he's, he's not an actual person captain zepp's a title yeah that so it's like become, 007 yeah or james bond because yeah. obviously James Bond's not the same person because he's played by lots of different actors. Oh, we might get a letter about that. Uh, so it does o- open up the opportunity because Series 2 seems to end with the implication that they might be back next year, yes. doesn't it? 
which yeah. never happened. No, which is it's quite sad because I'd, li- I'd like to see more. Mm. And you could keep on recomposing for anybody as Captain Z. Well, I've already suggested that Stratford Johns <laughs> would be a brilliant third <laughs> Captain Z. He'd need wheeling on. <laughs> <laughs> he could like terrify the kids, yeah. couldn't he? Now let's talk about the kids. Yes. So series one, that the, the, the they're really noisy, aren't they? God, they're noisy. Yes, because <laughs> when because it starts each episode starts with a shot of the kids in the audience, and it's a really quite it's quite nicely shot because it's sort mm. of a high shot. The camera sort of zooms over the top yeah. of them. It's almost like and, that 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 shot from uh, Would I Lie to You, yes. where the camera sort of zooms yeah. over the audience. Yeah, and they're all nattering and they're yeah. all really loud until um, Jason Brown. Yeah, appears and then as if by magic, it, and yeah, and he's the principal of the Solve Academy. Yeah. So I'm wondering how much time is supposed to have passed between the actual video that you're going to watch and now, because in the video he's sort of he's just learning. He's almost a student himself, yeah. and he's, he's sort of Captain Zex assistant. So are you implying that these videos happened a few years ago? Yes, yeah. so it's like in the past. Oh right, okay. okay. So that's that's the sort of impression i get yeah um and there's this running joke in series one which is fun it's not even really that funny but it, it gets a bit annoying after about episode three where the first captain zep just continually gets his name wrong he does a bit of a heart and all with, yeah. like chesterton you know he gets chesterton wrong but he yeah i mean yeah he, he was it pink and all yeah. sorts of things like, at least he doesn't call him tartan or something yeah, like that so, yeah and, uh, but, and the and the, the Professor Spyro, who is in mm. in um, that series, yeah. she's doing some kind of accent. The <laughs> actress, we still not quite pinned it down. But there are accents all over the place because oh, each planet's got its own um, weird accent. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and they're all sort of a variation on different Earth accents. Yeah. So they'll be like a Russian or a German or American or French. Because uh, aren't the fish the people fish are, French? The fish people are French. The, um, and one even says, "I listen carefully. I will say this only once or something." Isn't yes. it? Which is a bit weird because mm-hmm. Aloello has barely even started no, at this point. it's been the pilot and yeah. that's all that's been, isn't there? Yeah. But yeah, season two is Death Under the Sea, The Missing Agent of Ceres, The Small Planet of Secrets, The Sands of Soria. You were disappointed with that. I wanted that. more dinosaurs. You wanted that. more dinosaurs. Yeah. The Tree of Life. That, I wanted dinosaurs, actually. That one's quite eco- ecological, isn't it? It is. And Death by Design. Yes. And two of the characters, because the, the, um, in The Tree of Life, there's a queen mm. and in uh death by design there's a female fashion designer and they're both quite similar because they both have you can just see their eyes and they're then sort of mouths are covered by something else mm. so it's like they've run out of ideas a bit yeah because there's a lot of um roboty looking things with long necks <laughs> Uh, the, which after a while you're like, I, don't, I feel like I've seen this character before. So. What do you think about their cozies though? Are they um, practical for space detectives? Well, Not really, are the, they? The, yeah. It, it, again, especially it, the ladies. Yes, it, it kind of annoys me that because Professor Sparrow in series one's in the studio scenes, yeah. seems to be wearing a corset. Yeah, and um, she's got uh, uh, spirals on her chesticles. <laughs> Um, and I was intrigued whether her spirals went the right the same way. They don't. They don't. No. They, she's got yeah. opposite threads. Yes. And in series, <laughs> series two, is she named after her spirals? Possibly. Yeah. yeah. Spyro. Yeah. Um, in series two, Tracy Charles, who plays Professor Vanya, mm. is wearing the most incredibly high heeled shoes and boots, and because there's the sort of stairs, almost sort of light entertainment stairs, yeah. aren't they? That they walk down. Sort of ally like, sort of like Cannon and Paul or something <laughs> at the start, and she doesn't look when she's walking down those stairs. Yeah. Do you reckon she's practiced a lot? She's, uh, she's obviously, I think she's counted how many steps it is. Yeah, so she's counting in her head because um, when Richard Moran comes down as Captain Zepp, he's looking at every step as he walks <laughs> He doesn't down. want to go ass over tip, no, does he? That would, that would rather spoil his dignity, wouldn't it? Yeah. So. I mean, we said about the kids, mm. um, the, the whole kid interaction thing yes. is a little bit painful in Series 1, yes, isn't it? Yes, it is a little bit. It's better in Series 2. They've got fewer kids got for fewer a start. They've got fewer kids. And yeah. they do less of it. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, they, all the kids have been dressed up and they've got their, their air gel back. Yeah, and they've got they? their sort of uniform yeah. things But on. you reckon they've got them from like the nearest school? I think they've they? gone to the nearest sort of senior school. Because I reckon they're probably around 11 to 14, yeah. something like that. Not younger, not older, because older wouldn't do it, and younger are too young. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, they've just gone and like, either that or they're like Sylvia Young kids. Yeah. But I don't think they're quite polished enough to be Sylvia Young kids. No, because you, you were like, you were urging them on, right? Yeah. Just speak, form <laughs> sentences. Well, the thing is, I think what it You'd is... You'd have been is, dreadful in this situation, think, wouldn't you? I was being a bit unfair, because I think that as... Because Captain Zepp asked one of these children, "What do you who, who do you think did it? Mm. And I think that he's, a, he's put the kid on the spot. Yeah. And the kid is still thinking through what he wants to say so there's a bit of a gap why his brain's trying to go hang on hang on what am i going to say what am i going to say what do you think yeah. of their squeaky writing boards oh as they're well? ridiculous these sort of black um plastic things. plastic things with white pens where and i noticed in one of the episodes a bit of pen pinged off <laughs> i didn't see that so uh, we should say about Minnie as well. Yes, she's like a little handheld computer. Yeah, she's sort of like a a, a, a sort of mini orac, isn't she? Yes. Yeah. Because mm. is she supposed to fit in your pocket or something? I, I think so. Know. She's rather large to fit in your pocket. Yeah. Because also, I think the second captain, the second captain Zepp, leave her on a planet and they have to go back and find her. <laughs> they can't remember where he's left her. And then I don't quite understand his boss as well because he, he keeps talking to his commander on. Yes. On on the screen, it's just a load of like weird lights. I, th- I think the lights are just. I don't think that's meant to be his boss. That's just the screen, isn't it? I yeah. Think. I don't know. Though there is a character who's like a weird cloud, isn't there? There's there's the old yes. weird. Yes. You know the fact that they're doing all of the alien stuff as um, drawings yeah. means that you can have full reign with it because you can basically have what you whatever like. you want. And I understand why they've done it like that because to try and do these things practically, yeah. where it's just going to be a man dressed in a suit with bits falling off, probably because <laughs> they've probably got no kind of budget at all. So to do it as a drawing, you can you can get away with whatever you want. Yeah. Unfortunately, for some reason, a lot of the characters seem to be fairly similar in design. Yeah. You know, they don't seem to have taken advantage of the full range of things they could do. I mean, the set for the spaceship is not bad no. you know, for a kid's mm. show budget. There's some very familiar sort of hexagonal design yes. walls and, and mm-hmm. a few sort of consoles and things like that. I mean, Dick Mills is on sound effects, isn't mm-hmm. he? Um, that's confusing because created by Dick Hills and special sound by Dick Mills, yes. you've got to have a system to remember <laughs> them. But there's some, uh, you, you can... It's almost like they've got the Doctor Who sound effects yes. LP out for season one. He just one. plays different bits of it. Because you can definitely hear the um, Exelon City mm-hmm. ov- over the title music All in right, series uh, one. Mm-hmm. It's not over the title music in series two. They, mm-hmm. They've sort of got rid of it. Because the theme tune is like, it's in your head, isn't oh, it? God, forever. It's in your head, yes. Yeah. yes. And we've been going around. Sing humming it. it ever ever since and we sing along to it yeah so you, you've got a couple of radio times is there yes, haven't this is you for series two so the series the series two radio times mm-hmm. from friday the 9th of march mm-hmm. 1984 the same night as caves of androzani part two mm-hmm. so death under the sea by colin bennett term begins for the student space detectives at the solve academy a new Captain Zepp has been appointed to introduce a series of his famous crime detection adventures. When all the facts of the case have been given, Captain Zepp will stop the video and question the students. Will they have spotted the clues? Will you students at home, special solve logos now, yes, can be won is. by answering the questions correctly, so stay alert. Um, apparently, Professor Varner is stunning and brilliant, according I'm, to the Radio Times. I'm just reading this, this very small print on the episode two one, which yeah. is um, following week, which is obviously on the same day as of Caves of Androsani episode four. Yeah. And it says, to claim your solve logo and certificate... Oh, you get a certificate, do you? certificate as well. Um, send your answers together with a large stamped address envelope to... And then you send it to, to yeah. BBC Television... London. W12. AQT. AQT. Which is burned in all of our brains. <laughs> I just noticed that in Small Planet of Secrets, the planet's just called X. Yeah. And that's almost as though it was like Colin Bennett had to be down the pub quick. You mm. know what we call it? X. That'll do. <laughs> but yeah, the idea that it's Mr. Bennett, the caretaker, right, mm. writing space adventures is, is quite fun. And it is. I quite enjoy. I mean, do you think this would stand up to a DVD release? I think it would be virtually impossible to release on DVD because yeah. I think you would have to trace every single would you have to get the member kids? of our audience. Yeah, because I was I That's was thinking about point, this yeah. the other day because obviously they've released Who Done It mm. and Who Done It has audience participation, yeah. but it's only got 
one or two people, one in oh, yeah, a yeah. lot of episodes, and one when they had the competition later in the series, that's one person as well. So that's obviously much easier to get to, to contact that one person than to contact 10, which is yeah. roughly what you get in the kids talking in each series because you would have to contact them to find out mm, yeah, fair enough. if they give permission because it only takes one person not so and then you can't release it. Even that Tracy Charles deeply does not want this to be shown. Oh, I don't know. We should ask her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she's not. I'm sure she's not ashamed of it. I mean, I occasionally get fascinated by that strange ice cream wafer thing she's got at the back <laughs> of her head. I don't know what all that's about. It's just a collar, isn't it? Well, no, it's like the sort of thing you get in a raspberry ripple or something <laughs> like that. But, but yeah, I've, I've enjoyed sort of you know going through. I don't really remember watching it at the time. Hmm. Do you? I got a vague memory that I watched it, hmm. but. I don't know. I think it's more the theme tune than anything else. I think once you've heard the theme tune, yeah. as you say, it's in there in your brain forever. Yeah. So. And I do wonder whether people get it mixed up with Galloping Galaxies Possibly. as well. I do wonder if, if, I, if I have got it mixed up with Galloping Galaxies. Yeah, because yeah. there's, a, there's a bit of a rash of space things, yes. isn't there? Yeah. I mean, we should look up Galloping Galaxies as well. Mm -hmm. That might be interesting, because we always like a bit of Bob Block. Mm -hmm. But yeah, all in all, not not too bad a series I, yeah. I didn't quite know what i was letting myself in for but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite fun and we say so we um we watched the last episode of series two a short while ago and richard morant gets a bit of proper acting to yeah. do i mean yeah we should we should mention that richard morant's um from tom brown's school days yes. isn't he because he was he was flash man wasn't he yeah you know he's the bully don't you flash man he comes in and yeah He's, he's the bully. Oh, okay. He's not a okay, I thought he, he, he swooped in and no. solved solved things for the. the no, right. <laughs> That's where Lord Flash comes from in Black Adam. Flash art, maybe. Flash art, yeah. yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Mm. We'd have to ask. <laughs> but yeah, um, quite fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can track it down, then do. There are there's a there's a few knocking around on mm -hmm. certain places. Yes. If you if you look. Yeah. But yeah. And I think that's it for mm -hmm. for this episode, then, yes. isn't it? So we'll say thank you to everyone who's yes. who's contribute contributed. Mm -hmm. Could barely say that. Mm -hmm. And episode fifty two mm -hmm. will be along in due course. So we work out what is going to be on there. So are we going to end this with a point to camera or an eye boggle? That's the question because <laughs> that that's the real difference that between the, the difference. two yes. captains' apps. Yes. But. All I can say is that when episode 52 comes out, stay alert. And the theme music from Captain Zepp is available on a BBC record, which is now on sale. That was episode 51 of Round the Archives. Starring Lisa Parker, Andrew Trowbridge, Simon Exton, Ken Moss, Martin Holmes, Nick Goodman and Paul Chandler. On the musical side, you heard Dan Tate and Paul Chandler. Thanks also to Paul Ebbs, Joe McNally and Simon Morris. The scripts for Captain Zepp were by Dick Hills and Colin Bennett. And the producer was Christopher Pilkington. Solve logo, send your answers together with a stamped addressed envelope to Captain Zepp, BBC Television, London W12 8Q.
QT. I'll just repeat that. Captain Zepp, BBC Television, London W12 8QT.